welcome to Small Spark Theory. This podcast is designed as a collection of thoughts, ideas, and practical tips on using marginal gains to help your agency new business endeavors. Small Spark Theory is hosted and created by Lucy Mann, founder of Gunpowder Consulting. Based on over 25 years of new business practice, Gunpowder's mission is to help agencies take control of the new business process, create effective marketing plans, and provide tools to measure success. For more information, please visit gunpowderconsulting.com. Welcome back to Small Spark Theory. I'm delighted to have with me here today Felix Velardi. Welcome, Felix. Hello. Felix was introduced to me through a mutual colleague a couple of years ago and we chatted about new business and about consulting then I just in preparation for today I've just been reading through Felix Biog and it's one of those CVs that makes you wonder what on earth you've been doing with your life um so for those of you that haven't come across Felix before um he started one of the first web design companies, Hyper Interactive. He's a junk professor at Holt Business International Business School on the MBA and Master's programme. He's working with the internet's co-inventor, Vince Sir. He's consultant, non-exec director and chairman of a number of agencies in London and LA and is consulting and mentoring agency leaders. And when he's not doing all of that, he's also a glider pilot and a burner. Well, most importantly, mm. Felix, tell us about being a burner. <laughs> um, Burning Man is my passion, and I've kind of redesigned my life around being able to have as much fun as I possibly can. Each year I go and take part in Burning Man, and I'm part of a theme camp that gives away 10 grand's worth of cocktails during the week, and is epic fun. So I'm already planning this year's trip, which will uh, happen at the end of August. Sorry, £10,000 worth of cocktails. Ten ten thousand dollars worth of cocktails. Wow, yes. it's fun. Wow. Okay, <laughs> just going to think about that for a moment. <laughs> Imagine the chaos. Yes, that's yes. That's exactly what it's like. Well, cocktails aside, one of the reasons that I wanted to get you to come and talk to us on um, Small Spark Theory is I saw your talk at the Drum New Business Conference Brief Encounters in November last year. And one of the things that struck me was that you were using a really smart technique for planning. And one of the things that I've noticed over the the past few years working with agencies is getting them to use planning effectively. And, And certainly in terms of marketing and new business planning or growth planning, in my experience, it tends to be a bit haphazard or they'll go to the other extreme and put together a plan that's really involved quite complex and then just gets forgotten or it takes too long and everybody gets a bit disillusioned and a bit bored with the Mm. whole process Mm. and the techniques that you were using struck me as being really workable and an easy way or relatively easy way for agencies to quickly be able to pull something together and start Mm -hmm. to make some progress yes so I'm really really interested for us to explore that a little bit today but it would be really useful for the listeners if you could just give us a little bit of background on the Felix story so far. <laughs> well I started my first agency in 1994 more or less by accident and largely because I was completely unemployable and the internet uh, or the World Wide Web had grabbed my attention and I had uh, a great business partner and we started one of the first web design companies as you said Hyper Interactive. Mm-hmm. A couple of years later, I started an agency called Head New Media, and that became the digital arm of Lowe, so what's uh, Mullin Lowe now. Um, and I've had a, a series of relatively first-in-market agencies in online PR and interactive television and kind of invented ECRM by borrowing CRM from uh, Mei Lin Fung, who'd invented it at Oracle. So I've had six agencies all in. I've run the conversation group which was a collection of 12 agencies and then uh, about two and a half years ago so at the end of 1994 I decided that I'd done my time I'd done 20 years of running agencies and agency groups uh, and I wanted to uh, end that career so I sold my last agency and got into consulting and chairing agencies 
and putting in, in into place development plans, essentially taking an agency that had potential but wasn't realising it and turning it around and giving the founders and owners clear direction and clear competitive differentiation and help, helping them grow. And I've been uh, very fortunate over the last couple of years. I now have eight agencies that I either chair or I'm a non-exec director of. I've got a few clients here in London and in Los Angeles that I consult with. I've just started a new practice of helping people set up uh, agencies and position them for growth and put in place growth strategies both through new business and through differentiation and through alignment, which are the th three biggest problems that we always get. And so far, touch wood, every single one of the agencies that I've worked with has grown at least one and a half times over the last 12 months. And yeah, it's fun. It's great fun. That's amazing results. <laughs> I think, really I think the, the, the common factor actually is, if, I, if I'm really brutal, the common factor is any plan is better than no plan. Mm -hmm. And I've had a career of, as a strategist in digital and a career uh, finding clear blue water for agencies and making certain that they are very highly differentiated from the rest of the market. And I think if you add three things, one is a plan with a process for achieving the plan, mm -hmm. competitive differentiation, so clear blue water between where you sit and what the rest of the market does, and total alignment internally. If you get those three things right, more or less, you can only outperform the market. So that's what I, I spend my time doing. It's what I've spent the last couple of years doing, and, and it works. You talk about the agencies that come to you for help. What are the usual triggers for them to think, actually, we need someone like Felix on board? Well, there are two. I mean, most recently, obviously, the, the new practice of um, setting up agencies and, and helping define the proposition and creating the plan for them. That's people who are really, really ambitious and they want to start and they're not really sure where to start. I think most agencies start because they have a client and they don't want a boss. I think if you plan it rationally, it gives you a flying start. So that, that that's interesting. But the rest of them, largely... They can see that there's an opportunity to go for a, a high value exit, say being valued at 10 or 12 million pounds to the shareholders on exit in say three years time. Uh, they don't really know how to get there and they've been stagnating for the last three, four or five years. I think most agencies go through the kind of boom and bust and feast and famine mm. cycles just because they don't have a uh, steady plan where every single person in the organization knows which way they're going and knows that it's just about turning the handle on the machine. I think if you create that machine in an easy enough way uh, and a clear enough way, you can uh, inculcate that. You can, you can make that process part of the culture, get people aligned and head all of you in the right direction. So I guess it's people who are frustrated that they're not quite getting the offers that they want to get and really want to make more out of it. And my specialty is taking companies through two or three of the standard sort of ceilings that happen at one, two, five, and 10 million turnover and getting them through that through great process. And to some extent, I've done it so many times that I've probably made every single mistake that you can make. Mm -hmm. And so in kind of the way that Steve Jobs articulated beautifully and I therefore can't, you can only really join the dots up when you look in reverse. I've been there several times, so it's very easy for me to join up the dots that lead to what works and high value. Mm. I read um, a really lovely quote a couple of weeks ago. I think it might have been Eleanor Roosevelt that said, learn from other people's mistakes. You'll never live long enough to make them all on your own, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was quite nice. It's true. You talked about some really impressive results over the last 12 months. Mm. Is there a standout case study? Yes, I've got one client who is a truly a no limits thinker. He's he's amazing. And I love that kind of client, the sort of client who says, I know that we're turning over nothing now, but why shouldn't we be turning over 20 million quid? I love those kinds of people because they're the easiest to help. Mm. So I have one who's, we did some exercises on competitive differentiation making them stand out from the market and we set some very very tough goals 
three-year goals. And one of the goals was to get to a million and a half profit mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the third year from basically a standing start. And once you set a goal like that, it forces you to say, can I do that just by increasing 10% or 20% 20, 20 a year? Answer, no. So how do you do that? And one of the answers that we came up with for him was, well, we need to do some acquisitions. So he's increased his turnover by um, just over 3.1 times in the last uh, 12 months. He's an amazing guy. Uh, we spend a lot of time training his team, uh, working on sales process, working on lead generation strategies that are just rock solid long term plans. Mm. And I think that the hyper focus on what they say they do, which means that every single client who wants what they say they do mm. has to come to him. Um, all the people who want to work in that particular niche want to come and work with him. And then he is driven by really big, ambitious goals, and he doesn't see any reason why he shouldn't be able to attain them. And so, yeah, he's a dream client. But that, that's my, I think, the top performing client this year, although most of them actually have doubled or tripled their uh, net profit this year. Can you talk us through the execution roadmap? There's a set of principles. There's a whole bunch of... Um, when you're the CEO of an agency or any other kind of company, there are a whole bunch of books that are kind of seen to be the mandatory reads. Mm. One of them is Jim Collins' amazing book, Good to Great. And he talks about several principles. And then there's another book uh, called The Rockefeller Habits, which has been updated very recently to Rockefeller Habits 2. It's called Scaling Up and by a guy called Vern Harnish, which is my number two recommendation for mandatory reading for anybody who wants to grow a business. And he talks about a series of different documents and different alignments and ways of encapsulating data. And I, I'm kind of a simplistic guy, so I, I, I like things that are simple enough to put on a single sheet of paper and that are simple enough for me to understand and also the people that I work with and their team. So there's a process called Execution Roadmap, which essentially starts with a three-year goal with a couple of metrics. Say your metrics are a million and a half profit in three years' time, mm -hmm. ready for exit. And it works backwards from those goals towards today. Tesco calls it man in the high mountain. Picture yourself on the high mountain, having achieved all of your goals. Now look back down at the mountain and work out how you got to where you are. The roadmap works in a similar kind of way. You, in year three, you need to have done a million and a half profit and you need to be ready for exit. So taking those things, if you think about people, if you are to be ready for exit, then you need a team that is running your business so that you can sell, concentrate on the sales process, and also so that you can leave. So in year three, you need a senior management team that is rock solid, that is perfectly running the business. Working backwards from that, in year two, you need a senior management team that is coming together, that's starting to learn how to run the business, that needs training, that where you need to... Um, identify who the right people are on it and the wrong people on it and who's most effective, what resources they need. And then working backwards again to this year, you need to identify who's going to be on that team. You might need to recruit a few people. You might need to train a few people, incorporate your company's values and make sure that it's totally embedded in that team. For every single thing that leads towards your goal, you need to take your goal and work backwards. And break it down. And break it down into small steps. Mm. You can do things like identifying superstars today and start assembling a senior management team. Uh, then you can identify what training they need. That might be next quarter's activity. And that, that applies across the whole business. In three years' time, you will need 12 retained clients generating 120 or 130,000 pounds of net profit each. So working backwards, you need to, to the second year, you need to turn all of your clients into retainer clients and find new clients uh, who will replace the one or two that you'll lose over the coming year or so. You need a rock solid client services team. Working backwards again to today, you need to be able to identify which clients are profitable, which clients you love working with and are passionate about, which ones are likely to be transformable into retained clients. You need to identify the client services team and train them and put in place the processes that will support them. You'll need to start using timesheets, for example, mm -hmm. because without that, you can't identify 
which clients are profitable and which ones aren't, which people are effective, which people aren't. Again, the sales process. In year three, you'll need to be finding three really big clients. In year two, you'll need to find five big clients and four smaller clients. You'll need a great sales process that's perfectly pre predictable. So in year one, you need to develop a lead generation strategy that will stand you in good stead for the next five years or three years. That lead generation strategy, you need to work down to granular numbers. How many people do we need to attend an event mm. each month? What's the process? How many emails do we need to send uh, to get people, uh, the right person to come to the event? How do you design the event? And so on. So it's just, it's breaking what seems like lofty goals down into mm. granular actions that you can take and execute today. I worked with a CEO who was forensic about that kind of planning. And it makes an enormous difference to the teams in a business when there are those plans in place and that have been broken down on a, on a more granular level and knowing that the plan that you have today is the same plan that you had last week and mm -hmm. it's the same plan that you've got Completely. next week is really empowering because as an individual or as a mm -hmm. team or, and as a broader business, you know exactly what you're being measured mm -hmm. against. And of course, you'll get some curveballs coming up now and again, but you can just kind of regroup back to the knitting. <laughs> They kind say. of, yeah. I mean, you know, day day to day gets in the way sometimes. Mm. Um, my role is to be an external person who comes in and says, "Okay, so uh, Sally, how how did you do against the tasks that you've got to deliver this quarter over and above your day job of creating an HR strategy, for example?" Or Johnny, how's the um, uh, referrals program mm. um, been uh, going in terms of the setup of that? And knowing that next month they'll then start having to test it. Mm. And that, that's a really interesting role for me. I think one of the interesting, or the great things about it is that when you put together the first senior management team, most people really want a plan. They really want to see that the company knows where it's going. So it's not only is it, is it good for alignment and for letting the senior management team know what the long-term and medium-term and short-term goals are so that they know what they've got to do and what they've got to deliver and what they've got to delegate to their own people. But I've actually used the execution roadmap extremely well during recruitment because if you are competing for the best planner in the business or a great creative or a great production person or a fantastic office manager one of the things that will make you stand out is saying this is our plan so rather than just mm. saying here's a job description mm. these are the 50 things that you've got to do in your role it's these are our goals we're going to allow you to make your own decisions mm. as mm. to how you're going to help us reach those goals mm. but we're hiring you against the values of the company and the goals that we've set, mm -hmm. not against some long, turgid job description, yeah. uh, where actually you then start competing against everybody else on a level, level playing field. And I'm a great believer in not having a level playing field. Yeah. So it feels like they're being invited to join the journey. Completely. Yeah. And with alignment comes achievement. So working forwards for a second, once mm. you've got your competitive differentiation the, or competitive advantage, once you understand what your standout clear blue water positioning is, then you can start working out what kinds of clients you want and need. So we talked earlier about the need for 12 retained clients in year three and what you might need to do in year two in order to get that. Um, but starting off with lead generation, working backwards works really, really well. If we know that we've got to win 10 clients a year, then that's quite a tall order, but we can break it down into really, really simple steps. So if your pitch to win rate is one in three, for example, which is a sort of the standard reasonably good pitch to win rate. So unless you've had really good sales training yourself, you could expect a pitch to win rate of one in three. And you also know that for each pitch, you probably need 10 qualified leads. To get every single win, you need 3 times 10, which is 30 leads. Mm. So if you want 10 wins a year, that's 300 leads a year. Now, new business, broadly speaking, comes one third through referrals, one third through inbound, where you're not really sure what caused it, but you are doing some PR and you're doing some, you're in the lead tables and so on, writing good articles. Mm. 
that generates inbound. And one third comes from specific outbound activity, courses or events. So you know that you need to generate 100 referrals a year in order to stack up the right number of leads to be able to win the right number of pitches. And that allows you to say, okay, well, that's 10 a month, eight a month. We've got eight clients, so we need one referral from each of those a month. We need 10 qualified leads a month from outbound. So we need to put together an event or attend an event or do a show or whatever the activity is that generates us 10 qualified leads. And a qualified lead is somebody who wants what you do, has the ability to make the decision and wants it now. Those are the only three criteria for a qualified lead. If they don't meet any of those three, they're not a qualified lead. They're a prospect for some time in the future. It sort of tells you what you've got to do. By working backwards from your 10 wins a year, you need to get 30 leads a month from three different sources. It's just about breaking it down into tasks that are small enough to be mm. doable without being scary and without having to put 18 people on it. And in my own experience, having some great in-house salesperson or hiring a great in-house salesperson is never going to be as effective as you, the CEO, being passionate about what you do uh, and being able to show off the work that you do. Generally speaking, what you need is somebody externally who can identify the leads. Because it's not the pitches that you want to get to sort out, it's the right people who've got the budget now and who want what you do. So it's just about breaking down the processes. If you get 10 wins a year, that's a million pounds of revenue already mm. if you're um, winning uh, 100 grand clients. And you should be because 100 grand clients is, client is only 10 grand a month. So yeah. none of it's rocket science. and None of it's really too difficult. No. I think the beauty of the roadmap is that actually it's all common sense. And the, the lovely thing about looking at the numbers that way is that over time, if you track and measure your performance against those numbers, you can start to factor in how how you're performing so you can mm. see actually next year we know that referrals perform really really well so we can adjust our targets accordingly whereas the the inbound mm. things doesn't deliver quite the same so either we need to mm. turn that up a little bit or make compensation for Completely. it elsewhere it's, it's you're looking at a series of dials yeah so for example i've got one client who had been stagnating at about the million turnover mark. But their lead generation process is really good. So we spent some time putting it together at the beginning of the year. But about halfway through the year, we realized that there was a blockage and they were only winning about one in four pitches. So looking back at all of the different components of their new business strategy, the pitch itself became the thing that was keeping them at a relatively stable but not growing level. So we spent a day putting the top team through a pitching or pitch doctoring process. It was great fun. We had this great day together and I showed them a methodology for winning a pitch in a consulting way so that you end up selling value rather than having to quibble about whether your um, hourly, hourly rate is £88 versus mm. the industry average of £90 or whatever. Mm. Mm. If you can sell value, then it, it makes it so much easier, much more profitable. Mm. So we spent this day doing this, training them in this pitch process and... The first time out, they had a pitch uh, two weeks later, they won a half million pound piece of business. By breaking down and measuring all of the components of a new business process, it makes it very easy to identify where things need fixing or yeah. tweaking yeah. or upgrading. So really successful. But we wouldn't have been able to do that if we hadn't worked all the numbers back, no. watched it flow for about six months, yeah. and then identify where the problems were. Yeah. The key there is measuring the activity as well as the results, because if you're just focusing on the results, you've got no idea what you need to change about the activity. Completely. Yeah. And also the danger of focusing on the results, going all the way back to the beginning of mm. this conversation, of feast and famine. Yeah. What tends to happen is we say, oh, we've got too many pitches on, we can't do any new business meetings because we're all too busy doing these pitches. And then you wonder why you haven't got any pitches in three months' yeah. time, yeah. because you haven't got a machine that you're turning the handle on. Yeah. You need to be doing all of the things uh, steadily all the time. Otherwise, you get this pilot-induced oscillation and chaos and sometimes, unfortunately, failure. What would be your top three tips for any of our listeners today? It's really difficult to get down to three. Mm. The first is to understand your company's values. The values have to reflect 
your own values. And what I mean by that is if you are prone to shading the truth, having integrity as one of your values won't wash. So understanding your values, whether those values are entrepreneurialism or craftsmanship or integrity or always being forthright, being humble or whatever they are, understand the values. Three or four values are probably sufficient for any company. Values are really interesting because they become your hiring and your firing tool. You do not hire somebody who does not meet every single one of your values. And if anybody on your team stops displaying any of your values, fire them. That's number one is values. The values are the most important foundation for a coherent business that in itself has integrity. Second is get the right people on the bus. If you have anybody who is low performer, who is really difficult, who does not conform to your values, does not reflect the way that you want your company to be, who is not excellent, get rid of them. Replace them with somebody who is excellent. There's an old adage, A players hire A players, B players hire C players. You do not want to be a company filled with B and C players. If you're an A player, only hire people who are better at it than you are. So getting the right people on the bus, really important. Hire slowly, fire quickly. Can I just ask yeah. you on that? Because I found that that can be a real problem with senior leaders not hiring people who have potential to be better than them. I, I think it's mandatory. Yeah. I hire people who are better at it than you are and get on with it. I've, mm. I've spent my entire career, and to be fair, it's very easy for me to, find, uh, to, to hire lots of people who are much better at it than I am. Mm. My best advice is get out of the way of the people who are superstars yeah. and only hire superstars. Yeah. Why would you not want to own, uh, have any superstars on your team? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they should all be superstars. Yeah, I guess that's the thing, isn't it? Hiring superstars, but then getting out of the way and letting yeah, them do their thing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Delegation. My top, top tip for any manager, in fact, any CEO, the seven most important words for a CEO are, I don't know, what do you think? It empowers people to make mm. decisions themselves, to come to you with solutions. Let them come to you with solutions. N none of them, if they get it wrong, is going to break your company. Um, just let them get on with it. They'll learn and will become better. And the more they come to you and say, we had a problem, I solved it, uh, the more you can focus on your strategy. You asked me for three top tips. So yeah. you, I, I have a third and fourth, I'm afraid. Okay, go for it. The third is obsessive repetition of your company's positioning. So understand why you're different to your competitors in the eyes of your customers, uh, what it is that you are passionate about, what you can be the best in the world at, and then bang that drum for the next three or five years obsessively. You have to repeat it over and over again to your staff, to your clients, to the market, to your the people that you bump into at a, a party. If you can't describe what you do and why in a short, plain English sentence, then stop what you're doing, work out how to do that, and then get back on the, on the road. Every single person who works for you ought to be able to say to all of their friends, we are the world's best X. That may be, we are the world's most entrepreneurial creatives, we are the world's greatest craftspeople operating in the travel and leisure sector. Whatever it is, find something that you can be the best at, and then repeat it obsessively. That will colour the way that you train people, it will colour the way that you recruit people, and eventually you will be the best at those, I uh, like whatever that. it is. Yeah, I like that. And I do have a fourth. If you really want to grow, every CEO needs a mentor. I really needed one. I didn't have one for the first 10 years, and everything I did was chaos. <laughs> <laughs> but then I started learning. So I would say this, wouldn't I, because this is my career. But find a great non-exec or a great chairman who can come in, help you devise the plan, and then come in once a month to hold your feet to the flames. Mm. That will get you progress, consistent, steady, drip, drip progress towards an amazing goal. What's the best piece of advice that you've ever been given? I once subscribed to Harvard Business Review and they used to send you a, a red book at the beginning of your subscription and it gave you 10 top tips in business. And the first piece of advice was don't let somebody coming to you for advice put their monkey on your back. <laughs> and 
what that really meant was every, everybody who reports to you will come to you because you're the boss, you're the person with the vision, you're the person who's got the expertise, you set it up and they don't want to get it wrong. So they'll come to you and say, boss, I've got this problem. How do you want me to solve it? If you can train yourself to say, I don't know, what do you think? Eventually they'll start coming to you and saying, boss, I've got this challenge or this problem. I've got two different solutions I think might work. Which one do you think will work best? I don't know, what do you think? It's the best comeback to that. They will have thought about it and they will say, well, I think option A, your job then is to say, great, try it. Report back to me in a week or tell me when it's finished or tell mm. me when it's succeeded or failed. Mm. There's no shame in failure. The more you fail, the more you learn and the, the quicker we as a business will learn how to do it properly. So that single piece of advice of delegate responsibility, don't just delegate by handing people tasks. If you delegate by responsibility, they'll start with delegate responsibilities. And actually, then you get a really high performing team and you won't get problems coming to you apart from the mission critical ones. And it'll release you to work on the business rather than in the business. You mentioned earlier, you mentioned a couple of books that you recommend, one of which you said was your second all-time favourite business book. So I'm going to ask you for the first <laughs> all-time <laughs> so, favourite business book that you would recommend to our listeners. Okay, well, the, number two is Scaling Up by Vern Harnish, which is rich and dense. And, and if you follow all of that advice, you will make heaps of value in your company. And you'll sell for millions and it will be great. But it's a very complex book. And what I do and what the execution roadmap is, is a, is a simplified version of all of the advice in that book. But it's a fantastic read. Okay. My all time favorite uh, business book is called The Four Obsessions of the Exceptional Executive. And it's by Patrick Lencioni. He's written a couple of amazing books about management. And it's a parable. And it's about how to coach and how to manage people. And it's centered around obsessive repetition of the company's mantras and creating a culture of coaching and learning. One thing I've discovered managing and running agencies, it used to be awful that, that you know, when somebody comes up to you and says, boss, have you got five minutes? Mm, yes. It's that moment of dread. Everybody leaves. Mm. I discovered that actually everybody leaves. And actually, to be fair, I've left five or six times every single person in the company will leave and once you get your head around that if you can coach your people if you can get them coaching their people what happens is that you get constant improvement so i'd rather have somebody who was constantly improving but were and only worked for me two years superstars before being poached or going on to their next career move than having somebody who was steady and wasn't improving and stayed with me for three four or five years I think that's really important. What eventually happens that I learned a long time ago is that people start wanting to come and join your company because they know that they will be forced. They'll be forced growth. They'll learn loads and they'll become really excellent and they'll get high wages when they leave. So I advise always train your people, train them really, really well, train them fast and hard and make that part of your culture because you'll attract the best and brightest superstars. Felix. That's been really enlightening. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge and experience with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. It's competition time. We have a copy of one of the books that Felix recommended, The Four Obsessions of an Extraordinary Executive by Patrick Lencioni, which we're going to be giving away to a lucky listener if you want to join in the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Small Spark Theory, we will pick a winner and send a copy of this book over to you in the post. Tune in again next month when I'll be talking to Alex Seville and Dan Sudron from The Future Factory. You have been listening to Small Spark Theory, a podcast by Gunpowder Consulting. Music is provided by Duke Deck, available via dukedeck.com. Small Spark Theory is hosted by Lucy Mann, the editor is Isabel Jarvis, and the podcast is produced by Rosanna Miles at makemypodcast.space. 
Visit gunpowderconsulting.com for more information and visit our blog there to download further podcasts. Join the conversation on Twitter at gunpowdertweets, hashtag smallsparktheory. And if you like what you hear, head to iTunes and give us a star or five. Thanks for listening.